Today our talk will be about gastroesophageal reflux disease. And what we are going to talk about is what it is, how can we help it, and what is the problem associated with it. And what we have here at Texas Tech University and University Medical Center that could help you and could help our communities. I will try to keep it short, maybe around half an hour, because also I would like to hear from you. I know that probably you have some questions. We'll be very glad between the panel of the three of us, Dr. McCallum, Dr. Davis, and I, to answer all your questions. So what is GERD? The word GERD, you know, gastroesophageal reflux disease, people will call it many things. People call it heartburn, some people call it acid reflux, you know, some people call it sometimes stomach pain. They don't know what it is. And some people sometimes confuse it with heart attack, chest pain. But it is simply, it's acid reflux uh, happen when the stomach fluid, which is acidic fluid, go up to your esophagus. And if this happens, you feel it because you are not supposed to feel the acids in your esophagus. The esophagus is not designed to have acids in it. And when this acid go back, this one we have what we call reflux, which is going back. What will cause it? For a long time, we didn't know the answer for that. And I don't, I'm not sure if we have full understanding of what had happened, but we can find some association for why gastroesophageal reflux disease will happen. We know that people who have a valve, genetically altered valve, what does this mean? We have a small valve that is between the stomach and the esophagus. And this valve is one-way valve. The word valve means it's one way, which means stuff will go up, down. It should not go down, up. If it will go the other way around, then you have a faulty valve. And this happens. Some people are born with that. Some people have predisposition that when they get older, they will get that. And we'll talk about it later on. We call it hiatal hernia too. And then there's obesity and there's diet. And also with age, our muscle gets uh, weaker, and then the valve gets weaker, and it starts leaking. It's like at your bathroom, when you have, you know, it leaks, stuff leaks too, the same thing in your body. But GERD more than just a heartburn. Why? It is very prevalent. In the United States, this is the third most prevalent disease. Half of United States adults will experience symptoms of GERD almost monthly, and 20% will experience these symptoms weekly. And then the epidemic of GERD is related to, to what we call sober size culture. You go and you eat this super, you know, Big Mac and fatty food and tamales and all the stuff. And then you go home with heartburn, you know, and then what will happen? You know, all the night you're having reflux. You're drinking water, taking thumps, nothing helping. It's because we're eating too much. And we're eating too much at night time. We're not supposed to do that before. You know, people in the past used to eat a small amount, used to eat less fat, used to eat vegetables, fibers, good stuff as we call it. And they used to work and have more activities. And by the time they go to sleep, their stomach is empty, they don't have heartburn. If you look here in this, uh, I don't know, the chart is small, but you will find that our consumer of hamburger, cheeseburger, and Mexican food increased in the last 20 or 30 years. This was an old chart about consuming trend. This one is going maybe to 1990. I'm sure if we go to the 2000, it would be wor it will be worse. And even with the new generation, our kids, it's even worse and worse. You will see the kids, they only eat French fries. If you go to the restaurant, they define it as the kid's meal. What the kid's meal is? French fries or macaroni and cheese. What we are teaching them since we are young, we are teaching them to eat high fat content food. And that's why I think GERD, it is a manifestation of our industrial world. This is what we are right now. This is how we eat, this is how we behave, and this is what we get at the end. is gastroesophageal reflux disease. There is four major physiological mechanisms that protect us against injury. And I'm just putting this slide, it is more like medical slide, but I think uh, explaining it may help you to know what's happening. What you're seeing here is the tube, which is the esophagus. And what we're seeing here is the stomach. And this is acid there, or stomach juice. Here is the first mechanism. 
If you have food in the stomach, the stomach better be emptying it. If you have leftover food, or if you eat too much, that you have too much food that the stomach cannot handle, what will happen? There is higher chance that this food will go up. So the first mechanism to protect about, uh, again, is GERD, is to have a good gastric emptying. And then the second mechanism is the valve we are talking about here. We call it lower esophageal sphincter. Sphincter means valve. This valve, too, has to be strong and good and closing. And then above that, even if these two mechanisms fail, you have here some uh, protection through the lining of this esophagus. And also the esophagus can contract and can push this stuff down. So this four stuff will happen. If one mechanism failed, the other one would help you. What will happen in over time, one of these mechanisms will fail. You will eat too much. Your sphincter is already relaxed, either for genetic causes or for being older. And then you have, have reflux. Your esophagus is not moving well and will keep it up there. So it is a combination of many reasons. One or two could be enough to cause the reflux. And then, this is the most common thing, and people always ask about that. I have hiatal hernia. And nobody knows what is this hiatal hernia. You know, this term is very confusing because there is two kinds of hernia. We hear about the other hernia, which is down there. We call it the inguinal hernia. And this is totally different than this hiatal hernia. The other hernia, which is down there, we mean by that that there is a small intestine that goes a little bit through the skin. This is a total different story. And I see one of my, some of my patients get confused between these two kinds of hernia. Yes, we are using the same word hernia, but it is different kind of hernia. The other hernia, we need a surgeon to fix it. This hernia, what we mean with it, is that part of the stomach is going to the chest. So, what you are seeing here is the diaphragm. What is the diaphragm? The diaphragm is a layer that is protecting or preventing the stuff that's in the thorax, in our chest, to go down to the stomach. We have like compartments in our body. And then within this compartment, the esophagus here should be just right here. And guess what? The sphincter should be just right here and should be tight. What will happen is that when the stomach keeps getting bigger and bigger, it just moves up towards the chest. And that's what you will end up having. You will end up having part of the stomach up in the, esophagus, uh, in the thorax. We call it the stomach herniate up there. That's why it is hernia. But it is part of the stomach going up. What this will result into? That this sphincter up there will be wide open. That's why people who have hernia, they will get reflux. Because all the time, this door is wide open. Any acid will go down from here going up. Patients who have hyaluronic hernia, they have to be very careful not to eat too much, not to leave a lot of food there, because certainly they have a higher risk of having reflux. So what's the problem with heartburn? The problem is that we have a lot of complaints and we have complications. And if you have a heartburn for a long time, you can also get endangered. We have dangerous problems that could happen. I'm going to discuss this now. The misery or the problem will be chronic heartburn. And I see that in my clinic. You have patients who will come and complain. I cannot work. I'm not happy. I wake up all the night refluxing. No matter what I'm taking, I just cannot sleep. And you feel bad for them because it really can change your life. You will not feel how bad it is till you have a patient who cannot function normally because of heartburn. In addition to the trouble sleeping, you also have gas and bloating. And you also have food limitation because you know if you eat this, you're going to get heartburn. What will happen? You are scared to eat a lot of stuff. And not only that, reflux irritate up there your throat. And when it irritates your throat, you keep coughing. And you'll find these people who have heartburn waking up in the middle of the night coughing. They cannot sleep well because of that. They also will have the sore throat. And some people will also have bad breath. So it's not, it's not only reflux. It is a lot of other problem. We call it misery. will come with the reflux. And we call the reflux or the GERD, we call it like it's like an iceberg. You know what the iceberg is? It is this big ice. Most of it is under the water. And you're just seeing this little tiny small ice up there. 
It's like the movie Titanic, when the ship hit in this iceberg, they saw this little bit, why? Because there's huge amount of ice down there. The same is for GERD. We have large amount of patients. They never seek attention for it. Why? Because they have mild recurrent symptoms. Maybe if their symptoms become frequent, they would go to their PCP primary care doctor and tell him, hey, can you give me a bill for heartburn? And very few would be seen by somebody like me or Dr. McCollum, uh, the one who have chronic problems. So I would say the patient that we see are the tip of iceberg, and we know that a lot of people have heartburn that, that they never seek medical attention. So what's the complication? We know right now that GERD can cause asthma, it can cause dental erosion from the acid going to your mouth, it can also cause trouble in swallowing. And if you have GERD or heartburn for a long time, your esophagus will start to react by forming what we call narrowing of the esophagus. It can become very tiny, tiny, small tube. What will happen when this happens? You cannot be able to eat because you put the food there and the food will be stuck. And you'll find the patient coming and say, I feel the food is stuck here. I cannot eat well. In this situation, we will end up needing to do dilation to stretch the esophagus. And sometimes this stretcher or narrowing can be very bad that you may need up to six, eight months of endoscopy excision every two to four weeks in order to reopen it again. And when this happens, it happens in people who ignore their symptom. Does this happen often? Yes, we see a lot of patients who ignore the symptoms. They don't listen to their body. He has the heartburn and he feels that the food is stuck there. But he never goes to the doctor when he's, unless at the end, when he really cannot eat anything. They usually come to us when they can only drink liquid. And he wonder why he waited all this time? You know, he waited because he's busy, he has to go to work. But that's why we're having this lecture, to educate um, our public that when you have the symptoms, you should go and seek medical attention. What is the danger? And I'm going to talk about the danger later. Is the Barrett esophagus and cancer of the esophagus. And these two conditions are related because the Barrett esophagus is the way to get cancer of the esophagus. And we'll talk about this in a while. So when you should do diagnosis for GERD, since everyone have GERD, we cannot do tests for everyone. But then sometimes, we are not sure, sometimes people will have chest pain. We don't know if this chest pain is from heart or from their esophagus. How many times people think they have a heart attack and it is a bad heart burn? A lot, it happened a lot. How many times people will have a typical symptom such as coughing? Somebody's coughing, he take all this cough medicine and nothing helping him. And then we do tests to, to test him for reflux and we do find reflux and we give him reflux medicine, his symptom goes away. Also, if you have complication, and we mean by that if you have trouble swallowing or pain, severe pain. And sometimes people will take medications for heartburn by their doctor, but it's never helping them. At that time, you really need to have tests too. And if your symptoms keep coming back, you're taking the medicine, but your symptoms keep coming, well, this is a signal that you should see a doctor to help your symptom. And also, some people will elect to have surgery to help the reflux and maybe before that we have to do diagnosis. Okay, what we do, this one of the study we used to do in the past, we still use it, but this was since 1970 or 60, we're doing this barium swallow. It's basically, you will drink barium, which is a contrast material, and we take x-ray, and as you see here, you'll find that there's what we call a structure or narrowing of the esophagus. What's the next step? will ask that this patient will see a doctor. We, we do this test, but not as often as before, because right now we have a better test, which is endoscopy. And in endoscopy, you can see how bad is your reflux, and if the reflux have esophagitis. Esophagitis means irritation of the esophagus, like this one here. What you are seeing here is many ulcers in the esophagus, and the esophagus, because it has many ulcers, start to respond by forming narrowing, so you can see here is the circle of the narrowing. And if you leave it without treatment, this narrowing will keep getting bigger and bigger till it obstructs the esophagus completely. This is another test. We call it ambulatory 24 hours pH monitoring. The word pH means that we are looking at the acidity. And what we do in this test is we put a, something like a catheter through the nose in the patient's stomach. 
and then we leave them for 24 hours. We tell them eat and drink and everything. And whenever you feel the heartburn, just click here. And the patient will go home like that, having this in his nose. And then we'll eat and drink and come next day and we'll remove it. Of course, it's a little bit cumbersome, but this was the only test we had in the past to measure the acidity in the esophagus after we, um, uh, in the past to measure acidity of the esophagus for heartburn. And the idea is that if you have acid coming up there, this thing will detect it. And then you will colorate that with your symptom. So you'll feel the heartburn, you'll click, and then when we get the study, we know that you clicked in it because your pH was lower. And that's what we see, this is the tracing that we get, and you see patients who have a heartburn will have a lower value, which means they have acidic value. Well, right now we have a, even a better test, which was called wireless catheter-free esophagus pH monitoring. What we do in that is that we go with endoscopy, and then after that we evaluate where is um, the GE junction or the junction of the esophagus with the stomach, and we place this tiny monitor here. You don't have to have anything in your nose because just placed here, you'll go home for 48 hours, and this is how it looks like now the new uh, recorder. is much better than the one we used to have before. <laughs> this is how it improved now. And then, and that's it. And it fell by itself. We don't have to get it back or anything. It will just fill. It will go with the stool, and we don't need it anymore. And then we can measure your pH or see if you have GERD or not. By the way, this test is available here at Texas Tech. It's a new test. It's Dr. McCallum who's performing it. And actually, he's the expert in this kind of diagnosis for heartburn. So what we do for heartburn? Usually, we'll ask people to do either lifestyle change, do some change in life, and, or to take pills, or to do surgery. Or sometimes we have this watch, wait, and hope approach. It doesn't work all the time, of course. So what's our lifestyle modification? In every patient who have heartburn, he should be doing all this stuff. Number one, the problem with heartburn at night time that you are sleeping and you're getting continuous heartburn. So please, if you sleep, try to elevate the head of the bed four to six inches. And what I mean by elevating the head of the bed is to put blocks under the bed. Putting pillows doesn't work. It has to be blocks. So blocks under the bed, this will elevate the head of the bed. Avoid eating within two to three hours of bedtime because this is the time that your stomach needs in order to empty. You don't want to go to sleep on a full stomach. Also, you want to lose weight if you are overweight. Why you lose weight? The problem with when we get overweight is that you are stretching the diaphragm area and then you're opening the sphincter. The more weight you gain, the more open the sphincter down there, the more heartburn you'll have. 10 pounds sometimes are enough. 10 pounds are enough so that you lose your heartburn. And I saw that with some of my patients. Smoking is another problem. And we always say, if you are smoking, you'll have high risk of getting heartburn. And then modify diet. And this is a big thing. People do not like to modify their diets. They don't want to avoid eating fatty and fried food. And you'll see it. Every time you'll eat a fatty food, you'll get this heartburn. Peppermint chocolate, alcohol, carbonated beverage like Diet Coke and Pepsi, coffee and tea. And if you add somebody drinking his coffee, smoking his cigarette while he's eating his french fries, this is a perfect combination. <laughs> then you're really gonna get it. So medication for GERD. I know if you go to any pharmacy in Walgreens, you will have a whole section for medication for GERD. It is a lecture by itself. I don't want to spend a lot of time with it, but I would just say three or four words. We have many types of medication. Some of them are the old one, we call them the Tums. It's like a calcium carbonate. You take them, they react with the acid in the stomach. They work, but not that good. We have another one like called Dranetidine. You'll feel, you see it also over the counter. This medication will suppress the acid secretion. And then there is a newest one that probably all of you know it, the Burbal Bell. Nexium, omeprazole, lansoprazole, all this family. We call them proton pump inhibitor. Some of them are over the counter too. But the way they work is different than any other medicine. If you are going to take omeprazole, lansoprazole, 
or um, any of this family, you have to be careful that you cannot take it when you feel like it. It is not PRN medicine or take it when you need. No, you have to take it on a schedule. This medicine, the way it works, that when you take it, it has to be absorbed in your blood and then it will go and block the cell that's secreting acid in the stomach. Which means that if you are planning to eat your breakfast at 8 o'clock, then you take it at 7.30 in the morning. And here's what happened. Usually the doctor, your primary doctor will tell you, take your tablet first thing in the morning. Guess what I discovered? A lot of my patients don't eat breakfast. It doesn't work if you don't eat your breakfast. So if your biggest meal is your dinner, then take it half an hour before your dinner. If you are drinking coffee in the morning, that's good. But take it half an hour before you drink your coffee. So this is a, a, the trick because a lot of people do not take the spermidol or omeprazole the right way it should be taken. Um, and we'll talk about their problem right in. And then we have surgeries too. You remember the picture I showed you about the hiatal hernia? We have what we call anti-reflux surgery. And what anti-reflux surgery will do is that we'll try to reduce the hiatal hernia and we'll try to do what we call fundiplication. What's fundiplication? We wrap the stomach around the esophagus. You have all this area that's loose. We wrap it around the esophagus so that we have the sphincter stronger. Um, 10, 15 years ago, the surgery was very hot. Everyone wanted to have it. Why? Because you will be off bells. But what we found 10 years later is that some patient will be on this bells. Do we still need to have it done? Yes, we have Dr. Brian Davis here if you have a question about it. But we, yes, some patient, certain population will need the surgery. And sometimes I advocate for having the surgery. But it's not for every patient because any surgery will come with its complication. And this is a big topic by itself, but we'll leave that for the question and answer session. So what's the problem with our traditional approach of lifestyle change? That people want to eat what they want. And this is what happens all the time. They want to eat hamburger. And people want to sleep how they want. They don't want to have blocks and be looking funny upside down. And then some patient will tell me, so what my, my wife will do? She has to sleep also upside down or <laughs> something like that. And then she has to go another bed. It's just, it's hard. And also, by itself, it works in mild cases. So what about the pills? The bells does not treat the underlying cause of heartburn. It just treats the symptoms. We know that because you have hiatal hernia, you have other causes, and you have to take the bells. It is not like you're going to find the cure in one bell. You will always have heartburn, and you will always have to take your bells. And also, it does not get rid of Barrett esophagus, which we're going to talk about later on. Once you develop Barrett esophagus, the bells cannot help it to improve it. It can prevent it from getting worse, but it will not revert it back. And also medication by itself have complication. I want to stop here. I don't want to scare you about this. If you open any medication and you look at the side effect, you will find one page or two pages of side effects. You know, I have a hard time convincing my wife to give my kid 1% corticosteroid because she reads the pamphlet and she told me it have all the side effects. My son cannot take that. And I told her it's nothing, no problem, but I cannot convince her. So I don't want you to be scared about the side effects. It's very rare, but it does happen. If you take PBI for a long time, which is proton pump inhibitor or acid medicine, we found that it may affect the calcium absorption of the body and it may be associated with osteoporosis and there may be risk of fracture. But this risk is very low. That does not, otherwise we would tell people do not take it. But if I have a patient with osteoporosis, I will tell them be careful if you take this medicine for a long time. Also, some people believe that it can, um, because you are killing the acidity in the stomach, what happens when you eat your food and you have germ in it? The acid is killing the germ. If you are for a long time taking medicine that's suppressing it, then maybe you'll have high risk of infection because there is no acid anymore to kill your germ because the acid in the stomach has a benefit to. And so there's also other problems. There's other real stuff people believe that maybe it will stimulate the growth of certain tissue in the body. There is no proven evidence that can cause cancer. But still, I would feel uncomfortable to be in a pill for 35 or 40 years of my life. It's hard. And what's the problem with the surgery? The surgery is invasive because if I, after I tell you that, you will tell me, let's have a surgery then. 
and forget about taking pills, but remember that the surgery itself has complication. Sometimes it becomes very tight, and sometimes it becomes the rab get loose, and sometimes people develop problems swallowing, and sometimes it doesn't work. And actually studies show that 10 years after the surgery, patients who had surgery, they start taking anti-acid pills again. So it doesn't work, it is not a permanent solution. And that's why we have all this um, dilemma now, that one treatment is not, we don't have a golden treatment yet. So what, what's the problem with par What's the problem with GERD? The problem with GERD or heartburn, that you can develop this condition we call Barrett esophagus. And that's why the American College of Gastroenterology would recommend that if you have a heartburn for more than 10 years or you are above age of 50 and you have heartburn, you should have endoscopy done one time in your life. This is how your esophagus will look normally. This is how the esophagus will look like when it's inflamed. But guess what? When the esophagus is inflamed for a long, long time, it starts to change. It has this color. We call it salmon colored. You know how the salmon meat look like? If you eat the fish, it has this color, like salmon color. It's different than the normal, nice, bright color here. This is what we call parrot esophagus. And the parrot esophagus has risk of becoming cancer after that. So what would happen here is that you have a lot of acid exposing the cells here of the esophagus. And it's too much now. It's too much acid that the esophagus cannot handle it anymore and it starts to convert itself to another kind of cell. It is almost look like small intestine. Why? Because the small intestine are used to have acids. Esophagus is not used to have acid. So what will happen is that you will develop Barrett esophagus. So if we look here, this is how Barrett esophagus will start. What's the problem with Barrett esophagus? It is not a stable tissue, which means that it has a possibility that it will grow and multiply and would multiply too much, it will become cancer. And this is how it goes. It goes from just regular Barrett esophagus to a little bit of a change. We call it dysplasia or mild change. And then this change becomes a little bit too much. We call them high-grade dysplasia. And then once you reach here, you'll get to cancer, invasive cancer. That's why if patients have Barrett esophagus, and when we do endoscopy, we take biopsies. Why? Because we're going to look at this. Does he have low-grade dysplasia or high-grade dysplasia or cancer. I would like you to see this slide here. What you are seeing here, this is a pink, is esophageal adenocarcinoma. And this is the incidence um, of cancer over the last 25 years. Here is you have melanoma, prostate cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, and colorectal cancer. What you are seeing here, all cancers are stable, except what? esophageal one. It is getting, we are very scared about this now. Still, I don't want to scare you that everyone here have a esophageal cancer because it is still rare. But what we are noticing is it is increasing. And it is increasing than any other cancer in the body. We know that now we have a colonoscopy to screen for colon cancer. And we know that the, answer, that the colon cancer now is going is lower, or at least is stable in certain population. But what we do not have treatment for yet is esophageal cancer. Why is this increase happening? It is related to the increase in Barrett esophagus. And why Barrett esophagus is increasing is because you have a lot of heartburn. And if you can see here, heartburn increase, Barrett esophagus increase, cancer increase, and now we are almost to, uh, I think, four cases per 100,000. It's not that much, but it's still, it is high. So what do you do if you have a Barrett esophagus? So people who have a Barrett esophagus, you know, you can just watch and wait. You know that Barrett esophagus can stay as it is like that, or it can progress. How many of them will progress to be a cancer? Because I don't want to scare people, because somebody will say, I have a Barrett esophagus. Oh my God, tomorrow I'm going to have a cancer, I'm going to die. No, it's not like that. It's one to one and a half person from every hundred person. So let's say from every hundred, you have one will develop cancer from Barrett esophagus in a year. Let me rephrase it. If we have 100 persons in this room, all of us have Barrett esophagus, the chance is that next year, one of us will get a cancer. Which one? The problem that I don't know is which one. But we know that in order for the Barrett esophagus to become cancer, 
it has to go through this grades. It will not become cancer right away. It has to go from here to here to here. And the idea is that if we discovered where it is and in what she graded it and we prevent it, remove this bad tissue before it become cancer, then we prevented esophageal cancer. So what's the treatment? We want to get rid of bad esophagus. People have been trying many methods and we're going to talk about this method. One of them here called uh, surveillance, which is to watch. Watch and see. This is the one that all the insurance approved. You come to your doctor every six months to one year, we'll take biopsies from it, and then we'll see if you have cancer or not. Once you develop cancer, we refer you to the surgeon, he'll take your esophagus out. This is basically what surveillance is. What's the problem with that? You are leaving the abnormal tissue there. You have to come to the hospital many times, and also some people are very anxious. You know, they know they have bad esophagus, they're worried about it. We try to reassure my patient and tell them, don't worry, you don't have cancer, you know, but we still need to come in six months. Why doctor I have to come in six months? Because I'm not sure, maybe you are developing something. Sometimes we can extend this interval up to two years, but certainly once you have bad esophagus, you know, you should have endoscopy to evaluate it. Then we have another treatment called came and we call it photodynamic therapy. We don't do this treatment much anymore. The idea of this treatment was to burn the Barrett esophagus, which was a nice idea when it came, but it didn't work much because only it worked in third of the patient. And um, Mayo, in Mayo Clinic where I trained, they were big in this photodynamic therapy. But they stopped doing it. And the reason they stopped doing it is that if you see first the doctor, has to wear these big glasses when you're going to do the procedure. You are using some sort of reactors that the patient to have a problem that he cannot go to the sunshine for two months, for two weeks. So you do the procedure, you send the patient home, tell him to stay in the dark. It was a little bit cumbersome and at the end it didn't work much. So right now we are not doing it. And then there's something else called EMR, endoscopic mucosal resection. Endoscopic mucosa resection means that let's remove this mucosa and submucosa by endoscopy and cut it in a big pieces so that we get rid of this tissue, and which is good. But not every doctor can do that, you know. Um, I'm fortunate that I learned this technique at Mayo Clinic. We do it for our patient here. The problem with it is that you, if you have 10 centimeter long area of barred esophagus, I cannot remove all of it by endoscopic mucosa resection. It is time consuming. There is risk that you can make a hole in the esophagus. So we save this technique to remove areas that look suspicious. But certainly we do that all the time and it is a good treatment, but it is not enough. And then we have the breakthrough therapy, which we call radiofrequency ablation to eliminate bird esophagus. Radiofrequency is like what? Microwave. So we are microwaving the esophagus to get rid of the bad bird tissue. It's very fast. It works within 24 minutes. It removes the thin disease layer without affecting the deep layer. The problem with it that once you do it, the patient will have some soreness for maybe a few days. They have to be eating liquid diet for two to seven days after the procedure. And sometimes we need more than one or two treatment. And how it works, since we know that Barrett esophagus can become cancer, and since the mucosa resection cannot remove all of it, this one can work and can remove all this bad tissue and work right away. And I'm going to show you here. Let's say this is the diseased esophagus here. And we can get something like balloon to know how big is the esophagus is or sizing it. And then we can get to this ablation machine. This is the machine that's going to do radio frequency ablation. And then you can inflate it. You can burn the area. And you can go to the lower area and burn it too. And at the end, you will have this burned dead tissue. What will happen to this burned dead bird esophagus tissue? It will go down, we call it sloughed, it will go to the stomach, and then normal tissue will regrow in front of it. When this technique became available around, it was 2007 and 2008, it was at that time experimental. And then what we see here is a patient who at baseline had a bird esophagus, and when we did the ablation, what we see here and that the salmon color mucosa is gone and the esophagus look normal two years after ablation. We have success rate of 98 to 97 percent. 
Remember we talked about photodynamic therapy a few slides ago? What was the success rate? It was only 33%. And that's why we stopped doing it. But right now with the ablation techniques, we are having results up to 98 and 97%. And then this is a recent study it was done at the University of North Carolina. And it was about the response to ablation in patients who have high-grade dysplasia. <laughs> Remember the word high-grade dysplasia is patients who are having uh, a stage of birth esophagus that will become cancer. This is an imminent cancer. This is an imminent threat. This is the one that we really worried about them that they're going to develop cancer in the next six months. When we treated them with this ablation, as you can see here, the success rate was almost 90%. Uh, compared, we compared it to sham. This means that this treatment now for us, for birth esophagus, we believe that it is the best available treatment. Uh, after three or four years of data, we can say that um, it is something I would recommend for my patient. And because of that, at Texas Tech University and University Medical si Center, we got this equipment now and we're doing this procedure now for our patients. Um, by that and by talking about this new thing, I will stop my talk. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Thank you.